Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of my today's lecture is scarring alopecia. The disease which I will be covering in this lecture include the follicular lichen planus and all the other uh, related conditions, then discoid lupus erythematosus affecting the scalp and causing scarring alopecia, pseudoplate of broke, central centrifugal secretorial alopecia, folliculitis decalvans and tufted folliculitis, and circumscribed scarring alopecia of congenital origin. So, uh, we will um, classify the diseases in this lecture as acquired and congenital secretorial alopecias. So, first, the acquired secretorial alopecia. What is a secretorial alopecia? It is referred to as a patchy hair loss that follows permanent destruction of stem cells uh, in the outer root sheath at the level of insertion of erector pili, pili muscle. Hence, this condition destroys the potential of hair regrowth from that follicle. It is either by disease that affects the follicles themselves, which will be classified as the primary secretorial alopecia, or by an external process, which will be called as the secondary secretorial alopecia. By secondary causes, you may uh, include burns or any other physical trauma. Any hair-bearing skin may be affected through secretorial alopecia, but this condition is most commonly present on the scalp where it is most frequently noticed as well. Histologically, the follicles uh, completely disappear and replaced by fibrous stelae. Patients with secretorial alopecia may complain of itching, burning, soreness, scaling or discharge when the diseases causing secretorial alopecia are active. So this is a classification which is taken from the Rook textbook of dermatology, which classifies the primary secretorial alopecias as those alopecia which are mainly of lymphocytic origin, in which the main inflammatory cells are lymphocytes. And these conditions include uh, chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus, lichen planopilaris and related syndromes which are Graham-Little syndrome and frontal fibrosing alopecia. Then pseudoplate of broke, central centrifugal alopecia, alopecia mucinosa, keratosis pilaris, spinulosa, decalvins. Then if the primary secretorial alopecia is associated with mainly neutrophils in and around the hair follicles in the dermis, then the causes include folliculitis decalvans that include the tufted folliculitis and dissecting cellulitis of scalp and folliculitis. Then there are a few mixed conditions in which both lymphocytic and neutrophils may be found and that is seen in acne keloidalis, acne neo uh, necrotica and erosive pustular dermatosis. Then we are now discussing the causes of secondary secretorial alopecia. The first and foremost are the trauma. Radiodermatitis, following radiotherapy, then mechanical injury like an accident, post-operative, for example, flap necrosis, a burn, accidental alopecia, dermatitis artifacta, self-induced alopecias, traction alopecia, hot calm alopecia. Then there are few Sclerosing disorders, which are associated with uh, scarring alopecia, and they include morphia, scleroderma, lichen sclerosis, 
sclerodermoid porphyria cutanea tarda, and chronic graft versus host disease. A few granulomas may also result in secretorial alopecia, and primarily these granulomas are sarcoidal granulomas, necrobiasis lipoidica, and other infectious granulomas like cutaneous leishmaniasis or lupus vulgaris. The, the list of secondary secretorial alopecia also includes certain infections like uh, bacterial infections, common folliculitis and carbuncle, then fungal, carrion uh, mainly and favors and tinea capitis rarely, then viral infections like shingles, HIV and varicella, then uh, protozoal infection like leishmaniasis, treponema, syphilis primarily, the gameta syphilis, then mycobacterium tuberculosis. Some neoplasias are also really causes secondary secretorial alopecia like basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, cutaneous T cell lymphomas, then secondaries. Lymphoma, leukemias, and cylindromas. The last point which we are going to discuss are the developmental defects or congenital disorders leading to secretorial alopecia. And these disorders include aplasia cutis, the Romberg syndrome, which is the facial hemiatrophy, verrucous epidermal nevi, hair follicle hematomas, incontinentia pigmentae, Focal dermal hypoplasia of golds, porokeratosis of mibili, various forms of ichthyosis, various forms of epidermolysis bullosa, then polyostotic fibrous dysplasias, and Conradi Hunerman syndrome or chondrodysplasia punctata. So, completing the list, now we uh, proceed to the causes of acquired. Secretorial alopecia. The secretorial alopecia is not a rare entity. It represents approximately 7% of patients which are seen in the specialist hair clinics. Most common cause in the Europeans is lichen planopilaris, while central centrifugal alopecia is more common than other forms of secretorial alopecias. White people are more commonly affected than the black people. And uh, most cases of lichen planopilaris is seen in women aged 30 to 50 years. DLE occur twice as common in women as compared to men and three times more common in people of African descent than the white people. Peak age of onset is around 40 years. So these are the figures for the incidence and prevalence. Now, individual diseases. The first disease we are going to discuss in secretorial alopecia is follicular lichen planus. The lichen planus is an idiopathic inflammatory disease that affects the skin, hair, and nail. For detailed discussion, uh, description and uh, discussion on lichen planus, you can refer to my previous talks. In minority of cases, the lichen planus have a follicular predilection, which affect mainly the scalp and tend to produce secretorial alopecia. There are three variants of follicular lichen planus. The first is the classical lichen planopilaris. Then two, number two is frontal fibrosing alopecia. And number three is Graham-Little syndrome. So first, <clears throat> the classical lichen planopilaris. The lichen planopilaris is morphologically a variant of lichen planus that involves the hair follicle and has been classified as the primary lymphocytic secretorial alopecia. It occurs most frequently in Caucasians and Indian population, while lower incidence in Asian populations. Male-female ratio is 1.8 ratio 1. Sorry, female-male ratio is 1.8 ratio 1. It is likely related to the inflammatory response mediated by T lymphocytes, which are targeting the hair follicle antigens. 
it is possible that infections, metal exposure, stress, and other factors may sensitize or trigger this condition. Clinical features. Recent scalp lesion may show violaceous papules, erythema, and scaling, just like a usual lichen planus, but this lichen planus is primarily affecting the follicle and have a follicular distribution. These papules are replaced quickly by follicular plugs and scarring. Eventually, the plugs are shed from the scarred areas and the scar area remain as white, smooth and shiny and of course atrophic. The follicular orifices are absent and there are loss of skin markings within the area of scarring alopecia. The lesions are accompanied by complaints of increased hair shedding. Of course, as the follicles are being involved, more and more hairs are shed. Then itching, which is usual in all the other lichen planuses as well. Scaling, burning and tenderness of the scalp. These Subjective symptoms worsen with exposure to ultraviolet light by scalp irritation, sweating, and by stress. The anagen hairs are pulled easily from the active lesions. Lesions may be single or multiple, but commonly involve vertex and parietal areas. So this is how the early lesions of lichen planopilaris look like. There are follicular plugging with a typical um, violaceous color, along with areas of alopecia. So the, in the initial phases, there is um, this follicular plugging. Later on, it is followed by scarring and um, hair loss with the hint of uh, um, dusky erythematous color. Site of predilection already uh, of lichen, plan lichen planopilaris other than scalp may include axilla, inguinal region, scrotum, and the flexures. On the body, it manifests as grouped or disseminated, follicular, flat, elevated, or hemispherical erythematous papules or punctate keratosis. Hair loss from such area is less likely to be of concern to patients then when the scalp is involved. So this is histology of a case of uh, lichen planopilaris. You can see from the top there is significant follicular plugging and the follicles are dilated because of this plug. And the interface change involves only the follicles. And you can see this band-like lymphohistocytic infiltrate which is involving the hair follicles. On higher magnification, you can see this interface change, the basal cell degeneration at the follicular epithelium. Prognosis. In some patients, the course of lichen planopilaris of a scalp is slow, and only a few inconspicuous patches are present for many years. However, in most cases, lichen planopilaris uh, rapidly progresses and causes extensive and permanent baldness. Alopecia can progress insidiously over many years. Management. The first line, time, the first line management of lichen panopilaris is use of uh, superpotent topical corticosteroids or intralegional uh, triamcinolone injections. Uh, tetracycline derivatives or topical tacrolimus are also helpful in arresting the disease progression. Sometimes oral corticosteroids are also used, but the lesions are resistant to steroid therapy and then they will be treated with hydroxychloroquine, which shows some improvement in 6 to 12 months. Further refractive cases of lichen panopilaris are treated with immunosuppressives like cyclosporin and mycophenolate mofetel. Third-line therapy include retinoids like acetretin, grisofulbin, thalidomide, dapsone, and minoxidil. 
some success is documented with use of perox peroxisomes proliferate activated receptor gamma antagonist which is pioglitazone. Finally, a combination of uh, dutasteride uh, and picrolimus is reported to be affected in patients suffering from frontal fibrosing variant of lichen planopilaris. So these are all the old, current and new treatment uh, modalities that can be used in patient of lichen planopilaris. So the second type of follicular lichen planus or the variant of follicular lichen planus is frontal fibrosing alopecia. It typically occurs in postmenopausal women, although it may occur earlier and can be seen in men. Familial cases are reported and are associated with DLE. The histopathology of frontal fibrosing alopecia is identical to lichen planopilaris, which I have just mentioned. Recession of frontal hairline is the cardinal feature, as the name signifies. In contrast to androgenetic alopecia, the frontal hairline recedes in a straight line rather than biotemporally and sideburns are commonly lost. So you can see the progressive straight recession of frontal hairline with scarring as well. Itching and pain occur. Loss of eyebrows in early and uh, is an universal findings. On close inspection, there is loss of follicular orifices. Perifollicular erythema and hyperkeratosis at the marginal hairline. The natural history of frontal fibrosing alopecia is one of the slow progression over many years. Management. A variety of treatments are used, which include topical and intralesional corticosteroids, hydroxychloroquine, doxycycline, finasteride, but there is no convincing evidence that any of which is effective. Then the third type of uh, uh, follicular lichen planus is the Graham-Little syndrome. The Graham-Little uh, picardy leisure syndrome involves a triad of secretorial alopecia of the scalp, lichen planus of the skin, and non-scarring hair loss of axilla and pubic areas. So if these three features are fulfilled, then we can call this is as Graham-Little syndrome. Most patients are women between ages of 30 to 70 years. Essential features, as I already mentioned, is progressive secretorial alopecia of the scalp, loss of pubic and axillary hairs with clinical evidence of scarring, and development of keratosis pilaris. Pruritus is in cons uh, constant feature, but reported in many cases. In most cases, the disease has developed aggressively over a period of weeks or months. So these images show patients of Graham-Little syndrome. You can observe the secretorial alopecia, the, the follicular lichen planus-like lesions on the trunk, keratosis pilaris-like lesions, and the non-secretorial hair loss in the axilla. Management, there is no treatment that can be called as universally acceptable. A short course of oral prednisolone is used to stabilize the rapid, rapid progression of the disease. Cyclosporin is reported useful in a few case reports. Then potent topical corticosteroids, hydroxychloroquine and thalidomide are all tried and found reasonably effective. Now, the second disease I am going to discuss is the discoid lupus erythematosus. 
quite a common uh, occurrence and cause of secretorial alopecia of scalp is a benign inflammatory disorder of skin most frequently involving the face or the scalp and characterized by well-defined red, red scaly plaques uh, with, which heal with atrophy, scarring and pigmentary changes. Disease can be generalized, which is called as disseminated DLE, affecting areas away from the face and scalp. There are hematological and serological changes in approximately half of the patients. And such changes suggest an autoimmune etiology. The scarring nature of the classical form of DLE means that early diagnosis and treatment is important to avoid the irreversible and long-term sequelae of this condition. Maybe on the face or on the scalp. The incidence and prevalence of DLE. The cutaneous DLE is seen in 4 out of 100,000 patients and 80% of those is DLE. Peak age of onset is 4th decade and female has almost twice as uh, common uh, as commonly suffer from DLE as men. Most commonly seen in Asians, African Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, Hispanic Americans than those of Americans of European origin and most common in those of Asian origin in UK. So the disease is more common in people with dark races. Then pathophysiology. Cutaneous inflammation in DLE is a process in which interferons, mainly type 1 and type 3, induced T helper 1 based inflammation with the predominantly lymphocytic infiltration. With CD4 and CD8 T cells, natural interferon producing plasma cytoid dendritic cells are predominant cell type in patients of DLE. And the number of these cells correlate with the inflammation and scarring. Predisposing factors to DLE include. Trauma, which is X-ray or diathermy, stress and ultraviolet light, infections and cold exposure, drugs like isoniazid, penicillamine, grisofulvin, and depsone. Histology. Now, the histology of DLE is quite interesting. The first feature in which it is similar to lichen planopilaris is the follicular plugging. But the follicular plug in DLE are smaller, while the follicular plug in lichen panopilaris are large and pulpy, bigger. Then the epidermis appears flattened with loss of ready ridges. And you can see this interface change at, at, at this epidermis. While in contrast, the interface change in lichen panopilaris is seen in the follicular epithelium. But in DLE, the interface change is seen throughout the epidermis. Then the second feature of uh, DLE is dense lymphohistocytic infiltrate seen around the vessels and around the adenexal structures with loss of hair follicles. On higher magnification, the follicular plugging and basement membrane thickening is visible. Basement membrane thickening is more visible here at the higher magnification. Basal cell vacuolar degeneration and pigmentary incontinence is seen here. And you can see dense lymphohistocytic infiltrate perivascular with some hyalinization of the vessels. Pigmentary incontinence. Then here you can see the interface change and colloid bodies. So DLE is one of the conditions that is associated with interface change but there is, this is not lichenoid as there is no band-like lymphohistocytic infiltrate. Now, here the typical features of DLE are obvious. That is the thinning of epidermis, interface change, and dense periadenexal lymphohistocytic infiltrate. So, the infiltrate is seen around the hair follicles as well as sweat coils and blood vessels, of course.
Clinical features. Usually, the lesions are well-defined erythematous patches or plaques varying in size from few to uh, millimeter to 10 to 15 centimeters. The scales are adherent and are typically called as the tin tack scales because if we remove the scales, you can see the horny plugs on the underside of the scale. These are the horny plugs which are um, occupying the dilated follicles. The surface present as dirty brown yellow appearance that is rough to touch because of the follicular plugging. Symptoms include pruritus, burning and scalp tenderness. If treated, the lesions get flattened, may clear completely or leave some kind of scarring. Scarring is seen in 20% of men and 50% of women affected with DLE. And scalp is only area affected in a significant number of patients. The inflammatory activity is most pronounced centrally within the areas of alopecia. Ultimately, large areas of alopecia are formed. Some cases burn out in one to two years, but others continue to progress for many years. The pigmentary disturbance, calcification and SCC is reported in few patients of chronic DLE. This is a typical lesion of DLE, a plaque showing thick adherent scale. The circumscribed or discoid form is most frequent, particularly occurring on cheek, bridge of nose, ear, side of neck, and then the scalp. Alopecia occur in scalp region in one third of the patient and is usually permanent. Wide follicular pits may occur in concha or triangular fossa of the ear. This is known as the Schuster sign, which is one of the, one of the diagnostic features of patients of DLE. On immunofluorescence, positive linear immunofluorescence of IgG, which is a lupus band test, may be seen in exposed areas. Then this picture is that of a secretarial alopecia with a few healing patches of DLE. Patient require a skin biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. ANA is positive in 35% and NT-Row in 10%. Routine hematology and biochemistry and urine testing for protein urea are sensible baseline investigations. Assessment of visual equity is must for all those who will be uh, who will be on hydroxychloroquine in future. Then the general management. Overwork, mental stress, and fatigue should be minimized. Patients should avoid exercise, excessive exposure to sunlight, and use appropriate sun protection. First-line treatment is topical 0.025% fluorcinolone cream or 0.1% betamethasone valerate cream. Occlusion may further be helpful. Intralegional corticosteroid is one of the main, stay, main uh, stream treatment, especially in resistant cases, and are effective on lip, mouth, ear, and scalp. Then topical calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus is useful alternate to corticosteroids, especially where there are chances of atrophy induced by steroids. Second-line treatment, usually the first-line treatment be with should be with one of the anti malarials. The most would start therapy with hydroxychloroquine 20 hundred milligram twice a day, reducing to 20 hundred milligram once a day as response is achieved. Chloroquine phosphate is, was previously used, but since hydroxychloroquine, this drug is no more used because this has more chances of visual side effects. The dose of chloroquine is 250 mg twice a day. For patients with severe, extensive or scarring disease, oral prednisolone is often given in a dose of 0.5 mg per kg 
and tapered over a six week period. It is quickly quick, effective and minimize scarring and allows the anti-malarial to work. Such patients who are on long term corticosteroid should receive uh, bone protection with biophosphonates or related drugs to avoid osteoporosis. Third line treatment include uh, oral thalidomide, methotrexate, and mycophenolate morphetil. The third condition we are going to discuss is the pseudoplate of broke. This is a idiopathic, chronic, slowly progressive, patchy secretorial alopecia that occurs without any evidence of inflammation. It is primarily in atrophy rather than inflammatory folliculitis. In recent times, pseudoplate has been used to describe the generic scarring alopecia, the end result of a number of different pathological processes. So previously, pseudoplate or broke was considered to be a scarring alopecia which resulted without any preceding inflammation. But now, pseudoplate of broke is considered to be an end result of different pathological processes. The diagnostic criteria of pseudoplate of broke include the clinical criteria, which is the irregular defined confluent patches of alopecia with moderate atrophy, which is seen in late stages, with mild perifollicular erythema, which is seen in early stages, with high female-male ratio 3 to 1, a long course of illness more than 2 years, and slow progress with spontaneous termination possible. The histological criteria include presence of normal epidermis, so there is no interface change, absence of marked inflammation, absence of widespread scarring, absence of significant follicular plugging, so all the features of active inflammation of LPP and DLE are absent, and absence or decrease in sebaceous glands. There is negative, direct immunofluorescence in patient of pseudoplate of broke. Histological examination reveal only thin and atrophic epidermis, overlying a sclerotic dermis, containing fibros fibrotic streams with no significant inflammation. Elastic stains are important, in differentiating pseudoplate or broke from lichen planus, DLE, and other scarring alopecia. With this stain, the elastic fibers are seen around the lower part of the follicles, whereas in all the other scarring alopecia, scar tissue consists of collagen and divide of elastin. So, if we do the elastin stain only in pseudoplate or broke, we can see the elastic fibers beneath. Uh, the affected follicles, while in DLE, lichen planopilaris, these fibers, elastic fibers are lost. So, you can see here in this picture, there is no significant inflammation, no interface change, mild acanthosis, no significant periadenexal infiltrate. Clinical features. The disease occur in both sexes at any age, most commonly in women over 40. Etiology and pathogenesis unknown. And 90% is uh, the cause by LPP. Alopecia is asymptomatic and discovered by chance. On examination, affected patches are smooth, soft, slightly depressed. Patches tend to be small and round or oval, but irregular bald patches may be formed by confluence of many lesions. The course is extremely variable. Most often there is slow development over many years. Here in the uninvolved scalp is normal and progression is sufficiently slow. The entire process can burn out spontaneously at any stage leaving behind only relatively small areas of alopecia. So you can see the pseudoplate of broke. You can mistake this finding with DLE or lichen planopilaris. But 
there is no typical feature of DLE and ligand panopilus hair, and only erythema and scarring hair loss is seen. Again, another picture. Management, the alopecia once occur is irreversible and will not respond to topical or intralegional corticosteroids. There will be no treatment that could arrest the progression. If disfigurement is considerable, then uh, autograft from unaffected scalp may be considered, that is a hair transplant. Then the central centrifugal secretorial alopecia. The central centrifugal secretorial alopecia is a form of scarring alopecia that affects mainly African women. It begins as a single focus of secretorial alopecia over the vertex of scalp that gradually spread outwards in a centrifugal pattern but remain unifocal. Female to male ratio is 3 ratio 1. There is both genetic and environmental factors. Traumatic hair care practices like hot comb may be a cause and follicular degeneration syndrome is also proposed. So here you can see, uh, this is a central centrifugal secretorial alopecia. On histopathology, there is almost total loss of follicular units here and sebaceous glands are replaced with follicular scars like here, like here. So it is managed by minimal hair grooming. Potent topical steroids can arrest the progression. Doxycycline or minocycline also to, to arrest the inflammatory process. And some result is achieved by use of topical minoxidil. Then the disease to be discussed is the folliculitis decalvans and tufted folliculitis, which is a kind of um, acute, infl acute inflammation involving the follicles. It is a progressive purulent folliculitis that involves any hair-bearing site, although most commonly seen on the vertex of the scalp. Usually, there is only a single focus of disease. The tufted folliculitis occur when the infundibular epithelium, that is the, that is the uppermost portion of the follicle, is damaged and heal with formation of large, common infundibulum between the adjacent follicles from which 30 or more hair follicles emerge together. Although tufted folliculitis is seen most commonly with folliculitis decalvans, it can also be seen in other form of secretorial alopecia like central centrifugal alopecia and pemphigus vulgaris. Epidemiology. Staph aureus is the most common pathogen and it is most commonly grown from the pustule. In some individuals, folliculitis is persistent penetrates deeply within the hair follicle and tend to recur after apparent successful treatment with antibiotics and finally result in scarring alopecia. It is mainly due to failure to confine and eradicate Staph aureus from the infundibulum, possibly due to disruption of the bacterial proteases provided by the inner root sheath. So because of this, the Staph aureus cannot be contained. You can see that initially the lesion present in the form of large neutrophilic abscesses and patchy hair loss. On histopathological examination, you can see the neutrophilic abscesses are seen within and around the hair follicles. On gram staining, these uh, multiple gram-positive bacterial colonies are seen like here. Men are affected more as compared to women from adolescent onwards and the characterized by painful follicular pustule become crusted 
Then a patch of alopecia develops from the expanding zone of folliculitis, eventually resulting in central area of scarring. The scar is indurated and boggy rather than atrophic in early stages. Multiple hair tufts, which is tufted folliculitis, is found. Emerging from common dilated hair follicle, this is giving appearance of the doll hair. In advanced cases, there is usually one or more rounded patches of alopecia on the vertex of the scalp, surrounded by crusting and few follicular pustules. The severity of inflammatory change fluctuates, but course is prolonged. You can see the tufted folliculitis, several hairs emerging from a single follicular canal in fundibulum. Tufted folliculitis is a variant of folliculitis decalvans. Scalp biopsy is required to confirm the diagnosis and swap should be sent. A fungal kirion may, make, may mimic folliculitis decalvans. Hair should be plucked and sent for fungal culture and PS stain should be performed on scalp biopsy. Management. Since it's an infection, the main uh, aim is to eradicate staph aureus. Antiseptic shampoos and topical clindamycin is sufficient for mild cases. For severe cases, prolonged course of dicloxacillin or flucloxacillin, but relapse occur when the antibiotics are stopped. So tetracycline may also be used. The only treatment that show prolonged remission is rifampicin in a dose of 600 mg once a day. It should be given combined with other antibiotics to prevent the emergence of resistant organisms. Drugs commonly used in combination include clindamycin 300 mg twice daily, fusidic acid 150 mg three times a day, ciprofloxacillin, doxycycline and clarithromycin. Tufting may be reduced by use of tar shampoos and topical keratolytics. Other measures include oral dapsones, oral zinc, laser depilation, 